opportunity if you haven't already off campus to share this live stream so that everyone on your Facebook feed can know that you are at church this morning with us and that they can join us too. What an amazing opportunity. I'll tell you what about this live stream. Um, it was so cool. I was on holidays last week, but I could just watch it. Like I could like, come back. I wasn't live with you, but was able to watch it. It's not so cool. Like what an amazing opportunity. So even if you're watching this after the fact, because you're on holidays, you're away or whatever it is, we're really glad that you're with us this morning. Hey, listen. Um, if you're new with us, we obviously we would just really love to connect with you. So we would uh, love it if you would fill out our welcome card. It's at freedomkw.com slash I'm dash new. You can find it there. It's going in the live stream feed for you now. Uh, Caitlin is live stream hosting off campus. So if you want to shout out to Caitlin, she's the one who is behind the Freedom in Christ Church logo this morning. Woo. And um, hey, thank you so much for your generous and faithful giving. God has been so, so, so good to us this year. So thank you for your continued faithfulness. And don't forget that if you want to give, you can go to freedomkw.com slash give and it's all set up for you there. All right. That's, uh, we have an incredible morning for you. My name's Tracy. I'm the lead pastor here at Freedom. Pastor Ethan, our youth pastor, is going to be speaking, continuing at our series this morning. And he's going to, I think, he hopes, he's going to take us all the way to the Red Sea. Oh, hallelujah. He's going to take us all the way to the Red Sea this morning. So let's continue to worship. And I was thinking about, um, I don't, I haven't seen all of Pastor Ethan's notes, but I'm thinking about the miracle of the Red Sea. Thinking about how God consistently makes a way, you know I had to just go to this song and just continue to declare, he is our way maker. He's the one who can make paths through the Red Sea. He's the one who can make, Isaiah says, streams flow on dry land as well. He can find a way for us no matter what we're working through. So come on, let's worship him together this morning. You are here. 
moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives around, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, mending every heart. I worship you, I worship you, I worship you, oh. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Say, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. You're working, you never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. You are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper.
songs from scripture like that that just remind us of the things that Jesus himself taught us, the way he commanded us not to worry. And so I would encourage you, church, let's just listen to the command of Jesus this morning. Let's trust him with our words. Let's consider what, what we brought into this place in our hearts as weighing us down. Let's consider the words of Christ that says, I see all of it. Seek first me, my kingdom, and my righteousness. Everything else will be added to you as well. Trust him for those things. And then these words from Ephesians 4. To him who is able, it's Ephesians 3. To, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's the God that we're worshiping this morning. That's the God that we are looking to, the one we're trusting for the, the way to be made for us, our path to be cleared for us, the miracle to be provided for us. So come on, let's worship him. Let's remember who he is. Let's consider all of our worries and all of our cares and all of our burdens and lay them there at his feet, trusting him with them.
Father, you are so good. Father, may we rest in your presence today. Father, may your Holy Spirit fill this place. May it fill the homes of the people that are watching this. May it fill the homes of the people in this community, in this city. Father, we love you. We desire more of you. We desire more of you, Holy Spirit. Come now. Father, may you speak to us today. May you speak to us individually. May you speak to us through one another. May you speak to us through your word. Father, may you come in this place. Fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Father, today we lift up our leaders, the leaders of the province today. Father, I pray that you would give them wisdom and direction. Father, may you give them a touch of your Holy Spirit. Father, may we as believers of Christ, may we pray for our leaders, no matter if we agree with them or disagree with them. It doesn't matter. We should pray for them, God. And I pray that we walk out our faith and love, that we come behind our leaders with prayer. Because, Father, it is you who changes hearts. It is you who gives wisdom. It is you who gives strength. It is you who gives direction. So Father, we lift up our leaders of this province today. Father, may you give them the strength to carry on in a very difficult season. Father, I can't imagine the weight that is put on their shoulders right now. And so Father, I pray that you give strength to them and their families, that they feel your love and your support and your peace in this time. Father, I pray that they would know that you're there that you're with them, that they only need to reach out. May they always feel your love. So Father, we surrender all of our leaders up to you. We surrender our own opinions and our biases and everything like that up to you as well. And Father, I pray that we come together as a community in support of one another and of our leaders and of this nation. And so, Father, guide us through as we go into these next stages, as we're thinking about opening up and whatever else is coming up next. Father, may we have faith in you. May our leaders have faith in you. May they trust in you to guide their steps. May, you, may we trust in you to guide our steps. Father, may you be at the center of every decision of every boardroom, of every meeting. May your presence be felt. And so, Father, today, with this church family, I pray that your presence is here, that your Holy Spirit rests on each of us, that you would open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say, that you would speak through your word today, and that these would not be my words but yours. Father, may we surrender any pride at the door and just listen to what you have to say. So Father, we look to you, we thank you, we love you, and we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Amen. All right, you may have a seat. So good to be here with you again. Thanks for coming out on this nice, sunny July day. So we're going to be continuing in our summer series today, The Never-Ending Story. So we're going to be journeying through the entire Bible and looking at a lot of the main themes, a lot of the main characters. And so today, we are going from the patriarchs all the way up to Moses and the Exodus. So buckle in because we're going to be covering a large part of biblical history today. Now, the patriarchs are the line of men that God decided to use to establish the nation of Israel. This would include Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, it would establish the nation of Israel. So now last week we touched on Abraham. 
So I won't go too in-depth with him, but if you need a refresher on that, you can always check out our YouTube channel uh, for Pastor Aaron's message on uh, Abraham. So, but Abraham was the one that God made uh, what we know as the Abrahamic covenant with. This is where God enters into a redemptive partnership with Abraham. He promises a few things, those being that he'll be the father of many nations, a.k.a. he will have many descendants. Number two, that he will give them land. And three, that the earth will be blessed through him. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 to 3 says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This covenant that he makes is incredibly important, and we see God hold fast to this promise as the covenant is passed down through the patriarchs and reiterated to each one of them. To Isaac, God remembers it as we see in Genesis chapter 26, verse 1 to 5, where it says, Now there was a famine in the land, besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commandments, my decrees, and my instructions. Then once again, God reiterates that promise to Jacob in Genesis chapter 35, verse 9 to 13, where it says, After Jacob returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you. And kings will be among your descendants. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will also give to you. And I will give your land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the place where he had talked to him. And finally, to the rest of Israel. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 to 8. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Now, before we head into this historical account of the Exodus, let me just give you a brief overview of each of the patriarchs. It is by no means exhaustive, but rather to give you an idea of who they are and what role that they played. I would encourage you to actually dive deeper into them this week in your own personal study time. Now, Abraham, we touched on last week, so again, if you want to review that uh, fully, you can go back to uh, last week's message as well. Uh, But Isaac, Abraham's son, was a miracle himself, being born to his parents when his mother was 90 and his father 100. He also bore an up-close look to his father's obedience to God, asking him to sacrifice him. Talk about an awkward trip home. Isaac trusts the servant that God led to find his wife, Rebekah, and eventually she bore twins, the eldest Esau and the youngest Jacob. Now this is the story where those two sons come up. The eldest Esau, who was a hunter and was out all day and returning, famished, begs for food from Jacob, who does so only in return for the birthright from Esau, to which Esau agrees. This being an incredibly huge deal, as Jacob now has the birthright that the eldest son would have and the large inheritance that comes with it. Then as time drew near for Isaac to pass on, he is tricked by his own wife, Rebekah, who favored the younger son, Jacob, giving him the blessing This fulfilled what God had told them at their birth in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, where it says, The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. And so Jacob uh, becomes the one who God's covenant is passed down to, to be carried on. Now Isaac and Esau quickly discover what had happened, and in Esau's anger, he seeks to avenge himself by killing Jacob. So their mother tells Jacob to flee. In his escape, he stops to sleep one night and he has this encounter with God that we see here in Genesis chapter 28, verse 10 to 15. So you can take a second and flip there if you have your Bible. 
Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and laid down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Once again, God reaffirms his promise to uphold the covenant made with Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. And Jacob goes on to have this incredible story of how one night he actually wrestles with God that we pick up in Genesis 32, 24 to 28. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that the hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. At that point, we see the story. Jacob is about to come face to face with his brother Esau. And he is scared for his life, quite literally believing that this may be the end for him. But in this moment, he comes face to face with God. And he not only spares his life, but also gives him a new name, Israel, and blesses him. The name Jacob quite literally means heel grabber. Not exactly the most flattering name and calling to live up to. But the name Israel given to him means God contends or one who struggles with God. An apt name for one who had lived a contentious life up to that point. Not only that, but the nation of Israel was born out of Jacob. Jacob went on to father 12 sons that became the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then finally... We have Joseph. Joseph was Jacob's favored son out of the 12 that Jacob had, and his brothers despised him for it. So much so that after Joseph shared dreams with them that essentially looked as though they were bowing down to him, they left him for dead, but then decided to sell him into slavery. Now Joseph ends up being sold to Potiphar, who is a high-ranking official in Egypt. Joseph, however, ascends up the ranks, getting favor and becoming the overseer of the land and continues to be faithful to God. He gained the complete trust of Potiphar until his wife, who Joseph had rejected advances from, accused him of attempting to lay with her, and he is then thrown in jail. Long story short, after being the only one who could interpret Pharaoh's dreams of a soon-coming famine, he is restored and given a high-ranking status once again. And eventually, during the famine, his brothers traveled to seek food. And after appearing to treat him harshly at first, treat them harshly at first, even imprisoning them for three days and sending them to bring their youngest brother back as well, when they return, he reveals himself to be their brother and reconciliation begins. And now, this brings us to Moses and the Exodus, where we pick it up in Exodus chapter 1, verse 6 to 14. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, and they will become even, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Python and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed and the more they multiplied and spread, so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They, became, they made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Now if you notice that, In this passage, the covenant that God made with Abraham and upheld through the patriarchs is actually being upheld here. The nation of Israel is becoming incredibly numerous. So much so that even the Egyptians who were oppressing them came to dread and fear them. 
And then it says in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 to 24, during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And so you see here that in the midst of this struggle, this 400-year struggle, they cry out. In the midst of their suffering, they cry out to God. And it says that he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. He holds his promises. It is still there. And in the midst of this time, when they feel so far from him, he is there in the midst of it. And he remembers that covenant. And so in the midst of this suffering, he raises up a man named Moses. And so at the time, the Pharaoh, he actually ordered all of the Hebrew sons to be killed. And so, of course, the midwives, the Hebrew midwives, they refused to do this. And so they actually found ways of avoiding that so they didn't have to. And Moses' mother When he was born, she put him in a basket in the Nile River so that he could survive. And by chance, or, well, probably not so much by chance, probably more so by God ordaining it, he ends up being found by the daughter of the Pharaoh. And so while at first glance you might read that and think, that's not good, because the Pharaoh is the one who just ordered the death of all of these children. Well, the Pharaoh's daughter actually took pity on that baby boy and raised him. And in the midst of this time where the impossible was happening here, he is raised up. And uh, it comes to this one point where you might have heard of it, the burning bush, where Moses is a bit older and God appears to him in the bush and he is calling to him and he basically tells him, hey, I'm going to use you. And Moses in the middle of that is saying, no, I'm the worst. I can't even talk. And you're telling me to go and talk to Pharaoh. But he's like, no, I'm going to use you. I don't care how unqualified you feel that you are. I'm going to use you because my people are suffering. And my people have cried out and I'm going to use you as a tool to free my people. And so how many of us have been in a situation like that? Not necessarily freeing an entire nation. Probably haven't been there. But how many of you have been in a situation where God is calling on you to go and do something? Calling on you to go and talk to that person, share your faith. Calling on you to go and provide support to a person who is hurting and burdened and to shoulder that load with them. How many times has God called on you to do the unthinkable? to get you to step out of your comfort zone where you think that you are not qualified. How many times has he done that? And how many times have you responded, not yet. I'm not ready. And yet what happens is God uses Moses. And he also raises up Aaron, his brother. Because he's like, yeah, okay, you know what? You're not willing to do that. You're not willing to fully trust me quite. Yeah, I'm going to raise up someone else as well to help you because you're not going to do this on your own. There's going to be someone with you. And so he uses them, and they go to Pharaoh. And what happens, as you might have heard, is plagues start to descend on Egypt as they go to Pharaoh and tell him to free their people. And so over and over and over again, ten times there are these plagues that come and inflict the nation of Egypt. And so it was interesting, Pastor Tracy and I were talking about this this past week over lunch, um, and then I heard it again in a lecture that I was listening to, was that each plague actually correlates to one of the Egyptian gods. And so what happens is, or actually the name of the Pharaoh is connected to the sun god Ra. The idea that the sun god, one of the supreme gods in the Egyptian religion, gave birth to the Pharaoh, and the Pharaohs were direct divine descendants of the sun. And what happens in one of those plagues? Well, God blocks out the sun, shows himself supreme over the sun god, and so forth. And that is one of the themes of Exodus and the themes of this story is that God is supreme over any other God or idol or anything else that these people have. 
It doesn't matter what they come up with. It doesn't matter what they come back with with their magicians or anything else in the story here, as you'll see if you read a little further into it. God is supreme. And he shows it. He puts it on blatant display. There's no ignoring that. And I found this one part funny. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 8 to 10, it says this, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people, and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. Moses said to Pharaoh, I leave to you the honor of setting the time for me to pray for you and your officials and your people that you and your houses may be rid of the frogs, except for those that remain in the Nile. And how does Pharaoh respond? Tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry, What? In the middle of a plague of frogs, like I'm sure everyone is sitting there like, what? Like his advisors are probably like, dude, we're sick of this. They're in our homes, they're in our beds, like this is disgusting. Like, come on, why would you not just say right now in this moment? Like God is literally speaking to him through Moses and Aaron here. And he's like, tomorrow. And it begs the question of each of us because Pharaoh continually hardens his heart, right? How many times has God called on us for something that we shouldn't be doing? And we're like, we'll deal with that tomorrow. What about that one sin in your life that you don't really tell your small group? You don't even really tell your friends at times. You're like, you know what? I'm a little comfortable here. I'll deal with that tomorrow. That's a little scary that's a little uncomfortable. If someone finds out, if I tell someone else, that might be a little embarrassing. I'll deal with that tomorrow. What are we holding on to today that we're pushing off until tomorrow but need to be obedient in right now? And that's a question that I need to ask myself. That's a question that we need to continually ask ourselves because that's not a one-time thing. That's not something where it's like, okay, you know what? Once I've dealt with it, I'm done, that's it. Rest of my life is smooth sailing. No, there's going to be new things, new temptations, new ways that the enemy is going to try and attack you. And you have to deal with that now. You have to cut it off. So don't respond tomorrow. When God calls on you and he is clearly speaking to you, say, yes, here I am. Let's do this. And then we move forward after these 10 plagues have gone through. And finally, Pharaoh, after the final plague of the firstborn sons of Egypt being killed, he lets them go. And so the Israelites, they are leaving now. And this happens in Exodus chapter 14, verse 10 to 12. So you can flip there. But it says, as Pharaoh approached, so the Israelites, they're towards the Red Sea now. And the Egyptians are in pursuit. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. So they're at this crossroads here. They're not sure where to go forward. They've got the enemy pursuing from the back. And they're scared. And they don't know what to do. And their response and fear is to be like, why don't we just go back to that? Why don't we go back to the thing that we were just freed from? Because in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of the fear, we forgot that God brought us out of that and brought us towards freedom. And how many times in my life have I been looking back over my shoulder? Way too many to count. There's been so many times where I'm going forward and I'm looking back and I'm like, okay, you know what, God, you see him? Like, he's there. He's right there. What's going on here? Like, he's literally right there. Do you not see that right now? Like, I just give up. I'm done. Why don't we just go back? 
because he's right there. But we forget that the enemy is in pursuit. He's behind. He's catching up. And God is going ahead of us. And he's preparing the way. And he's there for us. No matter what it is that we are going through, he is there. And he's bigger than the enemy. And no matter what is in pursuit, he has power over that. And we need to remember that. And when we respond in those moments where we are so afraid and the enemy is right there and we are looking over our shoulder, we need to turn to God and say, okay, what's next? What do I do now? Where is it that you're leading me to? What people do I need to talk to? Do I need to pray right now? Do I, of course you need to pray. Do I need to fast right now? Do I need to turn into your word? Of course. Speak to me, God. Help me. Give me the strength that I need to keep pushing forward and to come up to the Red Sea. And obviously this looks impossible and impassable. And what happens? Well, of course, God, through Moses, gives him the ability to split the Red Sea. And they start running through and the Egyptians on their chariots are chasing after them and they're running to the other side. And they're terrified. And yet, eventually they make it to the other side. And the waters close up over the Egyptians that are in pursuit, the enemy that is behind them. And they're free. And there's no more looking back over their shoulder. Because God was the one that prepared the way ahead of them and he knew what was going to happen. He knew how to make a way. It wasn't too hard for him. He wasn't scared by that. He wasn't thrown off by that. He went ahead. And what we need to do is we need to follow him. When he says go, we need to go. When he says stop, we need to stop. When he says back up, he's going to start backing up. You know, one thing that I love about the patriarchs is a lot of the obedience that happens there. There's a lot of very human things and a lot of failures in there, but, you know, there's a lot of obedience throughout, you know, each of the patriarchs as well. You know, one that always sticks out to me and I always love, you know, is when God tells him to sacrifice his son, which is really weird, like, at first glance, and you're like, What? But that was the one thing that he was waiting for his entire life. The one thing that he thought was impossible. And he was an old man. His wife was old. They're like, they've given up at this point. And then he creates this miracle where now they have a son. And it's everything they've ever wanted. And he says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son. I want you to sacrifice the one thing that you've always wanted more than anything else. I want you to sacrifice him. And how does he respond? Here I am. I'll do it. That's obedience. See, the story of the patriarchs and the story of Moses comes down to obedience. If each of the patriarchs, if they weren't obedient in following after what God had called them to, and where he was showing them to go, none of this would have happened. The incredible miracles that took place, none of them would have happened if they didn't say, yes, God, I'm here, I trust you, send me. And yeah, there were times where they messed up. Yeah, there were times where they failed, big time. But the good news is that God has grace. God has mercy on us. Thank God. (laughs) And then, a long time later, well, Jesus comes along. And that same grace and that mercy is shown in an incredible way. Through his son on the cross. His one and only son that he sent to die for us. Because he loved us so much. And we weren't only running from the knee enemy that was behind us but he actually set us free because we're not meant to just run and run and run and wear ourselves out but we are meant to be set free we are meant to make it to the promised land 
We are meant to keep going after what God has for us. And when God sent his son Jesus to die on that cross as the perfect sacrifice and then rose again three days later, we were free. And that's something that we need to recognize and hold on to because we cannot hold on to the shame and the guilt or any sin that we're just comfortable with now. We need to recognize the freedom that is in Jesus. The freedom that he displays from the Old Testament to the New Testament to the end of Revelation. There is freedom. No matter what it is, he's made a way and he is going ahead of you and he is there. And his presence is in this place. His presence is in each of your lives. He is with you. Take a hold of that freedom today. And so I'd encourage everyone today to reflect on that. Reflect on how you're able to be set free from whatever it is in your life, whatever those things are that you're holding on to. And you're looking over your shoulder continually. What is it? What are you looking over your shoulder at? And what do you need to start looking ahead towards what God has for you? So let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time this morning. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how you've shown yourself through the patriarchs, how you've shown yourself through Moses and the Israelites. And I pray that we continue to learn from your word. I pray that we would never stop learning from your word. I pray that we would just have an incredible curiosity for you and your word. And Father, may we just have a devotion to you. Father, may we not become comfortable with where we are. May we not become apathetic to our situation, but may we walk forward in the freedom that you have provided for us. God, go ahead of us. Call us. Give us the boldness to follow after you without hesitation. So Father, may your presence be with each of us today, throughout this next week, throughout the summer, and going forward. And may we boldly follow after you. Take hold of that freedom and share that with others. Father, we thank you so much for who you are, for how you're continually faithful, for how your promises remain true and how you always hold them, how you always remember them. We thank you so much, God. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Amen. sharing that, Pastor Ethan, we, we talk a lot about this series, you know, when we're in the office together, we always yeah. talk about how we, it's impossible, there's too much <laughs> material, it's, it's impossible, yeah, there's too much in here, but like, yeah. that was a great overview for yeah. us, and to be able to just kind of land in on some of those big themes, mm. um, there's so much even in the Passover, I know you probably were working oh, on this, yeah. like, I can't, it's like a whole <laughs> series just on the Passover itself, uh, so maybe we'll provide some resources about the Passover. Definitely. And that may be on our socials this week or whatever because there's so much great material in there. But the one thing I did want to ask you just before we close our service this morning, I'm, I'm listening to you talk about obedience as a theme mm. and also to be able to, when you hear God saying something to you, to say, yes, God. I mean, and not tomorrow. I, I had never noticed that in that scripture before. <laughs> like a little bit of that pride, like, yeah, we're going to do it, but on my timeline, yeah. you know, kind of whatever. <laughs> um, so, but how do we how do we recognize the voice of God? And um, so that's the question I'd like to get to in a second here. But I was remembering, yep. I was thinking about John 8 when Jesus says, you know, we love to say, um, uh, I'm going to just grab it here so I don't uh, miss, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We love to, we love to like um, quote that, you know, you know the truth yep. and the truth will set you free. But yeah. what Jesus actually says is, if you hold to my teaching, you are my mm -hmm. disciples then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Yeah. There's an if That's then, good. right? So oh, the obedience piece comes and then freedom comes with that obedience yep. piece to God, right? Yep. So the question I think for us is um, if we agree with you, and we I heard there's lots of amens in the room, so I assume that's true of you off campus as well. Um, we get that that's probably true, but how do we hear the voice of God? You made, you made a comment like, you know, I've heard that in my life or whatever. How do you hear what that is and know what it is? Because yep. there's a lot of competing voices. There's mm -hmm. a lot of busyness in my mind, there's a lot of busyness in my schedule, a lot of people, I, like everything is just, there's just so much information to every day. Um, how do I hear the voice of God? What do I know what that sounds like? How do I listen to it and how do I obey it? Yeah. 
Yeah, so basically it comes down to familiarity. Um, like anything, like any relationship that you have, when you get to know them and you're around them a lot, you recognize their voice and you recognize you know, different things about them, their characteristics. And so spending time with God, you know, whether that's in prayer and fasting and in the word, it's like you need to be doing that on a consistent basis. And especially, you know, being in the word, because when God speaks to you, you need to know whether that's coming from you or whether that's actually coming from scripture. Because if it's not backed up by scripture, then that's not coming from God. And we can often insert like our own biases and our own opinions into that and be like, oh yeah, no, I should definitely do this. But it's actually not biblical. And that can happen a lot. And then we end up getting led astray and stuff like that. So being in the word just consistently um, and actually knowing that, because that's how God speaks to us, you know, probably 90% of the time is through his word. He literally wrote that down for us. Like there's so many messages and so much wisdom that he is directly writing to us so that we can use. Like that's not just there as just like, you know, a quick reference or, you know, a feel good verse when, you know, you're feeling sad and stuff like that. Like that's his word. And he's talking to you through that. So definitely familiarity with him and spending time with him. Yeah, that's really good. I agree with that. Yeah. I, and I, I think, like, we've talked about this a lot, but I continually encourage people that the Bible can seem very overwhelming. Part of the reason we're doing this series is just to say, like, just kind of break it all down so it doesn't seem like, mm -hmm. a, a, like a completely foreign book. Yeah. Um, but I, I did see this. Like a, I follow, like, a Christian meme thing on Instagram because it's funny a lot of the time and they were saying there was like a girl and she's like God why don't you ever speak to me and then there's like Jesus just holding the Bible be like I, I wrote it all down for you here like anytime you want to know my voice um, for yeah. sure and I love what you say about checking against scripture because if you know mm -hmm. if you know the word the more you know the word the more you say um, like that doesn't nope that doesn't really line up but yeah. you do have to know what, you don't have to memorize it, but the yep. more you're in it, the more you understand the heart of God. That's what, that's really what, it's familiarity. Yeah. That's Yeah, great. and especially in like the age of information or misinformation, and there's like so many different things that are coming at you on a regular basis, you know, through, you know, whether you're on Facebook from that generation or whether you're on like Instagram hey, or TikTok. Whoa, 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 I didn't whoa. say any generation. I'm just going <laughs> to, didn't dive into that. I'm just going to say, um, <laughs> but whatever one you're on, you know, there's going to be stuff on there that isn't biblical. And there's going to be people that are, you know, like, okay, here's my theological take. Yeah. Yeah. But they're not theologians. They haven't actually studied it. They opened their Bible a couple of times. And now they're, you know, talking about it a little bit. You know, props for passion, but passion doesn't equate to biblical accuracy all the yeah, time. That's right. And so it's like to know the word and to know scripture you know, you're going to be able to come up against stuff like that and recognize it for what it is when you hear it and not just be like, oh, yeah, that sounds right, right? And then you take it in and it's actually, you know, leading you down a different path than you should be. Yeah, that's true. And it's, a, and it's, it's getting to know the word, but also the, the leading of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. is something um, that's, I would say, familiarity to yeah. um, having a conversation with a friend this week about practicing listening to the Holy Spirit. Like uh, he was saying, that's sort of, it's, a, it's something you learn to do. So sometimes yeah. you say, I think I hear something from the Lord. So you go to somebody who you trust, who knows the Lord, and say, this is what I think the Lord is saying to me. Can you help me understand, like, discern whether this is right? And learn what that sounds like. What, learn whether or not that's just you having a bad night's sleep or that really is the Lord speaking to you. And, and just humbly practicing what that is in your yeah. life to listen to those things, I think, um, is really helpful. I'm just trying to think how I'm going to punish you for the Facebook comment earlier, but I can't think of anything. <laughs> I didn't right list them. Not, <laughs> I didn't list the generation. Listen, my, my, grandma, is, my grandma is on Facebook too, so I guess that's Makes sense. it's the old stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, guys. Anybody off campus, if there's any suggestions on what I can do to Ethan this week to punish him for it. I'm on vacation, so <laughs> I'll see you later. You're so lucky. I'm getting out of town. You're so lucky. That's fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and I'll just will say one last thing. Um, parents or anyone who influences the next generation. One of the things I would say to you is when your children bring to you a problem or a question, they're talking to you about something that's going on at school or with a friend or they're wondering about something from the word. Um, and obviously the Bible doesn't speak directly to every single thing about the kid who pushed them on the playground or whatever. Um, but to know the word as a parent and to say to your kids, yeah. okay, well, what does, what does Jesus say? Like, what are the principles that, like, what are some of the things that Jesus has said? Um, really simply, you don't have to have memorized them all. You can go to scripture for those things. You can look it up, that kind of thing. But just 
in general, like what is the heart of God? What would the heart of God be in this situation? What would he say if he was here? How would he respond? Because our lives are meant to, to follow the path of Jesus. Like what would Jesus do kind of a thing, right? So as parents, that's just a really a great thing you can do with your kids is not just tell them something or say like, I don't know, whatever, but to say, okay, well, let's, let's discover together. Let's think together. Let's pray together about what does the word say? What are the principles of scripture that I can apply, that we can apply together to this situation and allow them to see how you are taking the word and applying it to like every little thing in your life. And it will teach, it will raise up the next generation to know the word. It really, really will. So that's just an encouragement to you. Something that's yeah. really helped Rob and I as we've been raising um, kids who are getting old. The <laughs> Instagram generation. TikTok maybe? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you won't, see me, on, you won't see me on the TikToks. That's true. <laughs> the TikToks, yeah. <laughs> because I say it like that. Uh, that adds up. Um, okay, this has been really great. Uh, thank you for leaving us at the Red Sea. Man. Next Sunday morning, we're going to go from the Red Sea on. Uh, Sweet. We wish that we were going there. directly to the promised land, but we're going to wander a little bit. Somebody missed out on that. What's that? Somebody missed out on that. Somebody missed Not out. Not all of us. <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> so we will, uh, we'll be looking forward to that. Uh, track with us. We want to provide some stuff for you for the in-betweens. There's lots in the scripture. Maybe we'll be able to provide some uh, stuff. And also we're talking about understanding the word. Uh, yeah. the, our summer email devotional series is all about things that the Bible doesn't say. Um, so just, just kind of for fun, but also for, you know, because you've heard things that, doesn't the Bible say um, bad things happen to good, don't, don't in the Bible God thinks uh, bad things happen to good people, and then we're just going to uh, address some of those things, or God wants you to be happy. Yeah. I think this week is coming up, or it was just, we did them, all, there's a lot of them, uh, yeah. God wants you to be happy. So just like to, to take the things that we think we know about the scriptures and, and put them into practice, so that's coming up on your email devotional too, so make sure you're a part of that. And church, we love you, and we're really glad that you were here. And uh, it was so great to gather with you on campus and off campus today. We will see you again next Sunday. Be blessed.